This is the end of all things. The earth has already given up its dead. Fire rains from the skies. Volcanoes erupt and lava spews like hissing rivers of blood from the stricken body of the planet. What remains of humanity huddles, screaming with terror in the rubble of its once proud cities. The fetid stench of carrion and death is heavy on the hot air from the blazing ruins and the privileged soon discover that their wealth and position can't stave off the stark horror now confronting them. Along with the poor and needy they once spurned and despised, billionaires scrabble and fight with the rest, offering bundles of useless paper for what few supplies remain. Violence, guns, and bullets are the only valid currency now. The earth is racked in its death throes, and the rich and poor alike with it. Desperation is indeed a great leveler. However, Armageddon presents no such horrors to those who have placed their faith in their Lord God. They have been saved at the onset of the rapture, lifted bodily from the planet and their everyday jobs, raised to the glory and protection of their caring God. No matter where they were, or what they were doing, with no warning, Almighty God and a demonstration of His power lifted them away. And they are not afraid because they are secure in this certain knowledge of their salvation. Cars crash, aircraft fall from the sky, and huge ocean liners run aground, all with their occupants still within, as drivers, captains, and pilots instantly vanish. Patients in operating theaters bleed to death as surgeons are lifted bodily away. It seems that salvation is not for all, not even for the helpless or innocent. The government and FEMA have failed, having collapsed under the sheer catastrophic weight of the disaster. There is no police force. There are no hospitals, no paramedics. There is no help of any kind. There are no longer any rules, except for those of naked survival. Parents abandon their children. Brother fights brother. Chaos and confusion rule. It is kill or be killed. This is the final accounting for the human race. But how could this possibly have happened? What went wrong? Why were we so blind? We are told that the warnings were there for those with the eyes to see them, and the predictions made to those with the ears to listen. One source of these predictions was a man who claimed to lift the veil of time and whose prophetic visions are now regarded as predictions of what has already come to pass and what still lies ahead. That man became known as Nostradamus. I'm David Shaler. Um, about 13 years ago, I blew the whistle on the intelligence services. Uh, went to prison a couple of times as a result of that. Had several attempts on my life. Um, as a result, went through a spiritual awakening and then finally went through an awakening in which I was told I was the chosen one of God. <laughs> and as commonplace people might find that, as difficult obviously as I found it to start with, I'm convinced that is the case and it's my mission to try and unify humanity. Uh, Armageddon is most known to us from the book of Revelation and it says that the Messiah will stand on Armageddon and announce the final battle of good and evil. Uh, and anybody who knows about this stuff will know that Armageddon actually in fact is the Greek for Har Megiddo, uh, a hill in Israel. Uh, I've actually been to that hill actually and stood on it and did a meditation on the altar and my word from God was that the, the final battle actually is within. Uh, which is also the strap of mine for the Spider-Man 3 film interestingly enough. <laughs> Um, so um, it's my firm belief that we've actually been through the worst of it, that there are some, sometimes doom-laden visions uh, of Armageddon or anything, but I'm not saying mankind isn't going to be tested in, in these end times in about December 2012, but God will not test us with something we can't deal with. Basically. I'm Seth Salem. I do various things, not least of which is I work as a professional exorcist. Yes, 
that means for real. No, that does not mean little girls slimy at walls. The important thing is that people have issues that need sorting that can't be done with other methods. I do my best to help them in a metaphysical, spiritual context. Armageddon, the Battle of Armageddon, is something you want to look at in terms of the prophecy itself. It's a big battle, and the idea is that we know how it's going to go. Christ is going to come back, he's going to defeat the armies, and he's going to stand on the Mount of Olives. In fact, to give you a quick quote, the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two. Then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Azal. That's quite an important piece of scripture, and we'll come back to it later. So, the Mount of Olives is due to split. That's been foretold in Revelation. And the Israeli Geological Survey has already found signs from the 70s that it's due to crack. There's the faults in there, they're waiting to go. All it takes is some seismic event, possibly a miraculous event, and then you will have that passageway opening up. Okay. With regards to the, the Battle of Armageddon and how it plays out and how all these things work, prophecy in general, think about it like this. You have a sports match that you desperately want to watch, but what you can't do is actually watch it live. So you tape it, you tee it, whatever. All day at work, you say to everyone, don't tell me the score, don't tell me the score. But on the way home, you pass somebody on the canteen and they say, hey, it was 3-1. You didn't want to know that. But you go home anyway, and because you're a fan, you watch it. As you watch that video, that TiVo, that recording of the match, you know that one side is going to win 3-1. But the players don't know that. As it unfolds in front of your eyes, they are playing their best. They have no idea that one side is going to win, one side is going to lose, it's going to be 3-1. You know that. Now, you can't go back and tell them. But that's what prophecy is. That's what a vision is. It's somebody seeing how it's going to unfold, not necessarily knowing the outcome. If you only knew it was going to be 3-1, you wouldn't know which side had won 3-1. But you could say, it's going to be 3-1. That doesn't help anyone, but it's there, and it can be referenced. And that means that other things you say have more credence. And that's the prophecies that we're talking about in Revelation, in Nostradamus, in Daniel, Zechariah. This is where they come from. They are visions that have been shown to them that will make up a bunch of prophecies that we can look back at and take and look at entirely and say, yeah, that's where it comes from. Born Michel de Nostradam in the French town of saint remy de provence in December 1503, he was one of nine children born to a grain dealer and public notary. Originally of Jewish stock, his father had converted to Roman Catholicism around 1455 to avoid the still ongoing persecution of the Jews in medieval France. At the age of 15, he entered the University of Avignon and began the study of geometry, mathematics, and astrology, which at the time had exactly the same scientific status as astronomy. However, disease led to the closure of the university and the young Michel de Nostradam abandoned his studies and traveled throughout France seeking out and studying ancient herbal remedies. In 1521, after becoming a self-taught apothecary, he gained entrance to the University of Montpellier to take a doctorate in medicine. Unfortunately, given the haughty and aloof nature of the university's authorities, he was forced to leave for the simple reason that he had actually chosen to pursue this vocation, which the university regarded as a manual trade and therefore not in keeping with their elitist statutes. It was haughty attitudes such as this that eventually contributed to the rise of the French underclasses and the bloody slaughter of the nobility during the French Revolution. 
Although he enjoyed a good reputation as an apothecary, Michel eventually decided that his future lay in other areas of research, and around 1550 he took an interest in the occult and produced the first of more than 6,000 prophecies, which drew him to the attention of the wealthy who began to consult him on matters relating to horoscopes and other psychic phenomena. Buoyed up by his success, he changed his name from Nostradam to the more familiar Latinized Nostradamus. And as was common in those days, he quickly became known by this single title. Using this sabriquet, he began what is probably the work for which he is best remembered, the series of prophetic books, each containing 100 of his quatrains. However, Nostradamus was well aware that the Catholic Church took a dim view of anything that carried the taint of heresy about it, particularly anything that might challenge its own inflexible dogma. So he attempted to disguise the information in the quatrains from the many religious fanatics ready to denounce anything they perceived as heresy. He devised a scheme already successfully used by many free thinkers of the era and set his words and predictions down in series of codes, peshers, word games, and strange syntax, as well as using various languages. Indeed, the seer had a dread of being summoned before the Inquisition to explain where his inspiration came from. But fortunately, the Inquisition did not consider that astrology or a scripture-based prophecy per se transgressed their rigid laws. And in fact, he enjoyed a good relationship with the church authorities. However, if the faintest suspicion of magic had ever emerged, then the outcome would have been very, very different and resulted in his death. The initial publications, simply called Centuries, produced a wide range of reactions. Some people thought him insane, others a liar, yet others thought that they were inspired by scripture. But more worryingly for Nostradamus in these superstitious times, there were a few religious zealots who decided that his work was satanically inspired and therefore a heresy. Fortunately for him, like many others who traversed the narrow boundary between science and magic, he enjoyed a measure of protection from the highest level. Catherine de Medici, the queen consort of King Henry II of France, became one of his greatest admirers and after reading his almanac for 1555, which contained hints that members of the royal family might be at risk, she summoned him to the royal court to explain himself. Nostradamus attended the court certain that his visit would end in his execution. But by the time of his death in 1566, through the influence of the queen, he had been appointed as counselor and physician to the king. It is strange that the influence of alchemy, soothsayers, mystics, and healers should have such an influence on those in high places, since the reaction of the family of the Russian Tsar Nicholas II to another mystic, seer, and healer, the so-called mad monk Grigory Rasputin, was almost identical. The Tsar's wife, Alexandra, sought his aid to cure her son from hemophilia, a disease common throughout European royalty at the time and partly caused by widespread inbreeding. It is thought that he inherited the genetic condition through Queen Victoria, who was his British grandmother. Rasputin seems to have alleviated the condition, although he did not cure it. This trend of accepting the reality of spiritual cures is also true of the current House of Windsor, who are reputed to have a keen interest in spiritualism and other forms of psychic questing. Yeah, Nostradamus is famous for his prophecies. Um, as with any prophecy, they're written in a fairly coded way. Uh, certain people obviously interpreted um, Nostradamus to have predicted Hitler, to have predicted the death of Diana. Uh, but generally speaking, all of these ancient prophets are concerned with one prophecy, and that is the arrival of a, a chosen one of God in the end times, in humanity's uh, greatest hour of need, who will face up to the forces of darkness and allow those human beings who choose to go on the journey of love to effectively ascend to a new world. Uh, what I find particularly interesting in my own case about Nostradamus is that one of the quatrains actually refers to 
uh, DM, and uses the phrase the lamplighter. Now, obviously, the light is a metaphor for Jesus Christ, but the letters DM can be found on uh, a monument at Shugborough in Staffordshire. Uh, this monument's known as the Shepherd's Monument, and it's said to point to the location of the Holy Grail. So it may be the quatrains in Nostradamus are pointing you to that particular uh, little puzzle that has been set, set for us by, essentially, by God. The puzzle at Shugborough is said to be one of the great ten uncracked codes of human history. And I've cracked that code. I've actually found out via uh, an incredible quest, via Rennes Le Chateau, via the Poussin painting, uh, the Shepherds of Arcadia, which is on the uh, monument at Shugborough, and all sorts of other things, but that in fact decodes as DM Shaler 777. <laughs> uh, obviously DM Shaler is my name, and, uh, you get the, and you get 777, which is in the esoteric held to be the beginning of the end times. Uh, which will be the beginning of the human spiritual awakening and my own particular awakening happened in the run-up to the 7th of July 2007, it's 777. Nostradamus, very famous prophet, not the only one, but certainly a very, very famous prophet and someone that his quatrains were spread about, he made copies for, well, quite a few people, but the important thing is that he was able to deliver a concise, packet-sized bunch of information. You had lots of other people that did prophecies that um, gave information of, of things to come, things that would be. You have all sorts of bits and pieces. You've got Henry Cornelius Agrippa, who's the father of modern Western esotericism, without whom institutes like the Golden Dawn wouldn't exist, um, who was a big fan of astrology, but they all did other things as well, just as Nostradamus did. You've got um, Agrippa who leads armies, who um, cures, you know, works to cure the plague in, in, in hit Europe, um, all at the same time. And there are things that he stated that also came out. Then you had the likes of John Dee, another very famous esotericist, who, um, along with developing the Enochian language from various sources um, and translating angels' um, intentions, was a cryptographer um, who is credited with many, many of British maritime victories, and without whom, and all these, with Nostradamus and Agrippa, you wouldn't find the rich tapestry that we call prophecy in the modern world. Do the prophecies made by Nostradamus really foretell the events far in the future? Or are they the mere speculation of a fevered imagination? The quatrain that so alarmed Catherine de' Medici and seemed to predict the death of her husband, King Henry II of France, read, The young lion would overcome the older one on the field of combat in a single battle. You'll pierce his eyes through a golden cage. Two wounds made one then he dies a cruel death. This single four-line prediction had worried Queen Catherine so much that she begged her husband, King Henry, not to take part in a forthcoming tournament. She knew his opponent was much younger and fitter than he, and she feared the outcome. To her dismay, the king disregarded her concern and decided to go ahead with the match. As Queen Catherine watched in horror from the stands, the two mounted men thundered towards one another as they met with a loud crash of wood on metal as a younger man's lance broke apart in the armor of the king, sending parts of it spearing into the king's gold-colored visor. The monarch was thrown violently from his mount and lay motionless on the ground. The queen and her panic-stricken attendants rushed to his aid and carried him from the field of combat. The royal doctors battled feverishly to keep the king alive, but to no avail and he died writhing in agony nine days later. A careful examination of the prophecy reveals how accurate it was. Two slivers from his opponent's wooden lance penetrated the king's gilded visor, piercing both his eye and a joint just behind his temple. Both slivers penetrated his brain and he died in agony nine days later. All exactly as the prophecy foretold. 
Can this be sheer coincidence or something else? Other prophecies made by this amazing soothsayer also give cause for consideration, and another quatrain seemed to predict the Great Fire of London and even the year. The blood of the just will be demanded of London, burnt by the fire in 66. The Great Fire of London started in a shop in the narrow, filthy, rat-infested alleys that snaked all through the city and blazed unchecked for five days. The devastation was total, and hundreds of acres within the city were completely destroyed. However, in this case, the blood of the just amounted to only six fatalities. In the year, it was 1666. Guesswork or evidence of something much more profound. There is another prophecy that also resonates with this fateful year this time from a different source. In 1648, another prophet, Zabati Zavai, the son of a wealthy Jewish family and a devotee of the mystic Kabbalah, predicted that the world would end in 1666. His flair for prophecy soon gathered a cult following, and he declared himself the Messiah, and through sheer charisma and eloquence quickly gathered a legion of followers around him. He spread his message around Europe, and the meetings attracted crowds numbering in their thousands. However, his prophecies of death and destruction led to his arrest and imprisonment in the far-off Constantinople. As he languished in jail, facing almost certain execution, he rethought his position and eagerly embraced Islam. This bought him his life, but destroyed his following who left in droves and like many self-styled messiahs before him, his predictions came to nothing. This was not true of Nostradamus, whose warnings of future events also seemed to predict the tragedy that took place on 9-11 at the World Trade Center. The prediction reads, Earth-shaking fires form the world's center roar. Around new city is the earth a quiver. Two nobles long shall wage a fruitless war. The nymph of springs pour forth a new red river. How could this man centuries in the past have foreseen the calamitous events unfolding that faithful September day as the twin towers of the Trade Center, a symbol of freedom, erupted in a hail of fire and smoke? How could he have foreseen the holocaust of death and disaster that shook the entire free world to its core? Did he sit late at night in some small, quiet room, the darkness illuminated only by the unsteady light of candles, as he gazed in rapt fascination at the images conjured in a scrying glass? How did he interpret what he saw, the explosions, the falling bodies, and the thick cloud of dust, all in a single act that changed history and swamped the planet with rage and fear? The sheer talent of this man has become a byword for prophecy, and his works include lines that seem to predict the French Revolution and the outbreak of both world wars. Each of his major predictions seemed to cover events that all had an effect on a worldwide basis. Why did his prophecies involve loss of life and the destruction of nations? Might the reason be that these events were so horrific that they left their indelible stain on the timeline past present and future, like a musical note stuck on a string that keeps resonating in all directions. The Sears' visions also produce claims of the arrival of Napoleon Bonaparte and Adolf Hitler, whom he referred to as Hister. The atom bomb, the Apollo moon landings, the death of Princess Diana, and the Challenger space shuttle disaster. Nostradamus isn't the first prophet who's had his uh, predictions come true. Um, you've got lots of stuff, and actually the Bible has a huge core of prophets in the Old Testament, because when you're a nomadic tribe in the desert, you have all sorts of people do all sorts of jobs, and quite often there was a prophet that was knocking about. Um, you have various things, um, for instance, Daniel, uh, of course, the end times general, Daniel is a fantastic resource. He's talking about the last 490 years, which he actually had, according to some, 483 years before AD 33. 
predicting the death of the Christ, the Messiah, who would come, and then he died, and then he rose again. And when he came back, you'd have seven years um, of the last seven years of the history while Israel gets everything else sorted, and that's when the new uh, kingdom comes. But the problem was, because of the way Jesus died, and according to scripture, the issues that surrounded that with the Jews not accepting him, you then had a break between then and the last seven years. There are so many things from Daniel which, um, you know, the way Jesus died, the um, Gentiles then rising, and you had the, the more noble Gentiles, um, that point to the fact that these last seven years, which are called the tribulation, as we'll come to later, those are the really important years for the for Israelites, and we'll see what goes on. One of the most famous um, predictions involves 2012. Nostromus has said it, all sorts of people have said it, 2012, ooh, big year. Of course, you get the same thing every millennium that it's about to be the end times, but 2012 was uh, specifically important for various reasons, not least of which is the Mayan calendar. The Mayan long count was blocks of about 5,000 years, which they turned, they turned over. Generally, there was some sort of event, and then something new changes. Now, at 2012, they run out. There's a problem with saying that means the end of the world, though. What happened was, once the Mayans had finished that, they were about to start a new one, and the Europeans went and conquered them. Everybody dead, nobody able to make a new long count, so it was never created. And it's gotten into the popular mythos, that means that there weren't any more long counts to be made. But it just means that there's due for another change, and when that change happens, it'll be big. What happens after that? It's up to somebody else to figure out. It's quite strange because we live in a very uh, secular society in the West in this day and age. And yet, you talk to most people, they will have heard the story of a chosen one, of God, who will arrive to save humanity in their hour of need. So it seems that this prophecy is still well known to mankind. Obviously you can read about it in all sorts of places. We think of the traditional places like the Bible and the ancient prophets of the Bible. But that story is being retold on a daily basis. Um, we can think of it in Star Wars, for example, the eternal battle of good and light, another chosen one of God. And uh, they talk about the force instead of love, but that's a, you know, it all works together. And indeed, I think that um, George Lucas must know it's Kabbalah because uh, the word for life force in Kabbalah, like the chi in Chinese or the prana in Indian, uh, is in fact the Dijed, hence the Jedi Knights. And the word Darth is the Hebrew for knowledge. And of course, in the eternal battle, actually, it's a battle of not so much dark and light, but love and knowledge. If you're trying to get there through processing knowledge, you realize you don't get there in the end. You come to see truth and justice and compassion through love, basically. And it's been told in stories like The Matrix. The story is also told most recently uh, in Avatar. And interesting enough, the word Avatar doesn't just mean little computer thing on the screen. Uh, the word Avatar was originally used to mean the incarnation of a god in the, in the Indian myths, basically. And indeed, that story is a classic telling of the prophecy. He's in fact a man, he's half man, half uh, Navi. So he's not actually one of the Navi people as such, he's slightly different from them. And he begins in their society at the bottom, he's clueless, but through his own talents he then uh, rises up to, to lead the tribe in a rebellion against their oppressors. And there's all sorts of imagery in that film. At one point, he's, he's like that, covered in these seeds from the, the Tree of Souls and all sorts of things. Uh, and again, in the Kabbalah, the, the high priestess is known as the uh, Zadeh, and the Zadek is the Messiah, is the name for Messiah, the, the man of righteousness. Uh, and their god was Ewa, which would be another way of pronouncing the letters uh, IHVH or IHWH, which is, gives us Jehovah or Yahweh, or in fact Jesus, if you know the secret of these things. Uh, Yahweh is Jesus. So this prophecy is, has been very well known to mankind. There have been what I've called in the past pre-millennial fever. Now, 2,000 years ago, uh, in the year one, what would be our year 1 BC, was in the calendar of light 3,999. So they were just before the next millennium. And as a result of that, they really thought the Messiah was coming. And this is where we've got the false story of the Christ from coming 2,000 years ago. My argument is that what happened 4,000 years ago is four books of prophecy, not history, were released. They're four very inconsistent books, so no one would claim that they could be as, uh, accurate historical records. Um, but in that time as well, in 1 BC, there is actually um, what will be called uh, an incarnation of God, not the Messiah, 
who did lead the Hebrews in a rebellion against the Romans, and the Romans record testified to the fact that in, on the 17th of August 1 BC, there was a mass crucifixion of Hebrew revolutionaries and their leader uh, was made an example of. So you can kind of see how that story in history has become equated with the story of the Messiah 2,000 years ago. But it's my firm belief now that we're very firmly in those end times. Uh, the book of Revelation talks about three woes, and that, that, those woes could be World War I, World War II, and World War III would be the three woes. And for those of us who don't think we had World War III, we did. They tried it in Iraq and Afghanistan, but they had to get into Iran as well to really provoke the war to begin. It didn't happen. And they've been trying to go into Iran for, for years and years now, and as far as I'm concerned, they're absolutely nowhere near it. And the reason there are concern with Iran, again, is because of the biblical prophecy. In the book of Daniel, again, one of the major prophets, he talks about uh, Babylon, which is the modern world, for the city of London and so on. Um, he talks about uh, Babylon being brought down by the Persians, and obviously the modern day Persians are the Iranians, so that's why they go after Iran. The reason they go after Russia as well is I'm convinced because the book of Revelation mentions the bear. So they are clearly working to a prophecy. And there are all sorts of secret societies out there, people who think the governments run the world really haven't been paying attention in the last 10 years. It's quite clear that governments are manipulated by secret societies, of which the Freemasons is probably the, the most well known, but I wouldn't say is the most sinister. And those secret societies have all sorts of funny ideas about what's happening in the end times. And certainly, I think one uh, group who, who belong to the philosophy of what we call Zionism, who believe that there is going to be an evil messiah, that the messiah will be, will be their man, bring about the subjugation of humanity. But in just about every other text, when you read about the, the prophecy, you realize it's actually about the triumph of good over evil. The man who will come to save humanity is the incarnation of God, and he will use his wisdom, but also his power within the law uh, to restore order to the planet. What then of 2012? What does the seer have to say about what might befall us? Did his glimpses of what lies ahead reveal the truth? Again, there are quatrains that seem to refer to that fateful time. It is here in particular that we find much to concern us when the doom-laden prophecies of Nostradamus find resonance with the final cataclysm depicted in the scriptures. At the time that the bearded star is seen, three great leaders will become enemies. Earthquakes and disaster falling from the heavens, the Po and Tiber rivers flooding, a serpent is seen on the shore. Mabel soon dies and there is a terrible slaughter of people and animals, and there is thirst, hunger and famine when the comet is seen. After great problems for humanity, a greater problem appears. As the millennium begins, floods Blood, milk, steel, famine and disease strike mankind. And in the sky, a fire with a long tail is seen. In the year 1999, in the seventh month, from the sky there comes a great king of terror to bring back the great king of the Mongols. Mars rules triumphantly before and after. All of these quatrains have several common threads running through them. Images of death, disease, destruction, and chaos, and the near continual reference to some catastrophe that will arrive from the sky. There are clear hints that the world will find new wars and new conflicts, and the blood of the innocent and guilty alike will flow in dark rivulets to some unholy sea. Stark images of end times, including Mars, Roman god of war, ruling triumphant, over the shattered earth. However, in addition to the prophecies of Nostradamus, there is more information in the biblical book of Revelations. Can this ancient book help confirm what the seer has predicted? In Revelations 9-11, yes, those sinister and unforgettable numbers are relevant here. In a bizarre synchronicity, we find the quotation, the angel of the bottomless pit also called the Destroyer. Could this be a reference to Osama bin Laden, the founder of Al-Qaeda?
Uh, the date of 2012 has come up as possibly the most likely uh, date for the, the true end time, the changing from this universe to the next universe. Now, I stress this is the end of the world, but not the end of creation. When I say the end of the world, it's the end of this construction of the universe. Uh, post December 2012, we'll come out in a new universe. But we can just talk a little bit about why I'm so certain about 2012. And that is, although there have been periods in the past when people have thought they've been living in the end times, it's normally been one culture. When you look across human culture, uh, the date of 2012 is the one that seems to come up the most often. Uh, primarily, obviously, from the Mayan calendar, which runs out either on December 21st or December 23rd, 2012. However, the, the date is also uh, hinted at in the Bible, basically. Uh, in the Bible, at one point, the book of Revelation, it talks about the reign of the Messiah or the Antichrist being 1,260 days. Now, there's all sorts of anagrams in the Bible, including of numbers. And out of those numbers, you could make 6,012. Now, 6,012 uh, is the equivalent in the year in the calendar of light of 2012 in the calendar Anno Domini. Uh, but there's all sorts of other places you can find it. That's a very good book by a man called Jeff Stray, who just goes across human culture and looks at drawing this, this one particular date out of it. And it's certainly, again, I can only really talk about divine revelation, but what God tells me is we're absolutely bang on course for the end of 2012. And it's quite strange here today doing this interview. It's the 24th of December 2010 today, so we're exactly two years away from the first day of the new universe, basically. Um, so yeah, so it is all point to 2012. I think it's interesting as well that uh, this hasn't really been broached very much in mainstream culture. On the whole, they want to keep any, any mention of the end times out of mainstream culture, but it's now become so prevalent amongst human beings that they've had to acknowledge it. They've had to make a film called 2012, in which, strangely enough, the strap line was, we were warned. <laughs> so again, a little message from God there. Uh, but obviously what they try to present that as is, is death and destruction. Now, obviously, as we approach 2012, we will be tested. Uh, from about 2011 onwards, the moon is going to go slightly off its orbit. It's going to start creating chaos on the planet. And we're also going to be hit by a solar flare. We were last hit by a massive solar flare, uh, a really big one, in 10,500 BC. And that solar flare was what knocked the planet like that, basically, and caused the ancient, what, what we call the flood. But in fact, it comes from the Latin word, uh, deluge is in fact the correct word, and, and deluge doesn't mean of water, it means of light. Uh, and so what's going to happen in 2012 is going to be hit by a solar flare. And it's going to be up to humanity essentially to save themselves. The Book of Revelation makes it very clear that those who wear the seal of God will not be harmed. And I think that this is, this is how the un unity of humanity will come about. At the moment we're all bickering with each other. But if the whole planet and the whole species is under threat, I can think of no greater rallying cry to bring us all together and forget what else, you know, stuff, basically our minor differences. We have enormous amounts in common, only minor differences. So they expect around um, summer 2012, and again this has been confirmed by science, I read an article with a new scientist about this, that they are expecting increased solar activity around that period. And that was an interesting example, I got it off God first, then got it off the scientists. Um, but I say, we can actually deal with that as human beings, um, it's not difficult, all we've got to do is live in love. But nevertheless, these things to test us are happening, but they won't be happening the way that people think. It's not about the wars and the famines and so on. Those great things like that are over. I'm not saying we've solved all the problems on the planet, I'm just saying that we're not going to go into nuclear conflagration or anything else. This is not the first time that the end of days has been predicted. At the time of the millennium, the doomsayers were convinced that the world would end and Christ would return in all his glory, leading the host of heaven to welcome the faithful to paradise. It did not happen, but that did not prevent certain groups from attempting to bring it about. One such group, a fundamentalist, led by a self-styled prophet who predicted that an earthquake would completely destroy Denver, Colorado in October 1998 was involved. The earthquake did not occur, but this did not prevent the prophet's followers claiming that he was one of two witnesses mentioned in Revelations 11. 
This prophet also predicted that he would die in Israel in December 1999 and be resurrected in glory three days later. He even went on to claim that he could speak directly to God, a claim that worried some of his already restless flock. The pronouncement has eerie resonances with the claims made for the Antichrist. Some of this small band attempted to settle in Israel to live a peaceful life in the Holy Land, but appearances can be deceptive. They were arrested by Israeli Secret Service agents who revealed that the group were attempting to blow up one of the holiest sites in Islam, the Dome of the Rock, and incite a holy war to bring about Armageddon so that the biblical prophecy could be fulfilled and Christ would then descend on the Temple Mount with his heavenly host. The End Times are a fantastic resource for everyone from fundamentalists who really want something to bang a drum about to fundamentalist atheists who really want to say this must all be complete rubbish. You have the idea that um, there's going to be some defined point where suddenly everything shifts or you have the more gradual progression which is actually what Revelation is all about. Um, that the, the bowls that are opened, the seals, uh, the trumpets, they happen but they're an evolving process. So you've got, you know, the earthquakes, then you've got the floods, then you've got the plagues, and these continue happening, and that's what we're seeing today. So we may very well be at the end times already. If not, I'll probably be out of a job, but you know. One of the most important things to remember about the end times or any prophecies like that is that you can't try and um, predict how prophecy is going to work out. If it was that easy, then someone would have done it already. Um, you don't know when it's going to happen, you don't know how it's going to happen, and you've got to be sort of able to look for the clues by looking at the whole thing. Because when someone receives a prophecy, it doesn't come, you know, all one after another after another. No one gets a script for any day, any year, anything. All you can do is say, well, this might happen, this might happen, this might happen. It'll probably happen in this order, but it might not. And that's where it takes a bit more than just the sort of pop prophecy, revelation, pseudoscience that you get a lot of today. But obviously this documentary isn't. So what you need to remember is that as you come up to the end times, what your own personal beliefs are, you have to think about the way you want to find yourself if it happens, when it happens. If it doesn't happen, fine. Constantine, Emperor Constantine, is the most fantastic example of this. Roman, born Roman, raised Roman, Roman gods. Deathbed, hmm. Just in case, Christianity. Everyone converts. Brilliant. Did he go to heaven? I don't know. We'll find out. Yeah, so uh, the, the clue to the book of Revelation is understanding that, like everything else, it's a series of codes. Once you crack the code, you actually realize that John the Divine wrote it is simply describing uh, the process of the universe changing from one shape to the other. Now, obviously, it has mentioned all that kind of chaos in it, but I say we've been through it. That was the chaos of the 20th century, the chaos we've lived through recently, which, when you look at it, has been the greatest injustice we have ever seen in the history of mankind. I'm not saying in terms of perhaps the number of deaths, but to God, death is nothing. Death is just a change, is just a change of consciousness. But in terms of the actual suffering and injustice here, the fact that on September 11, 2001, Effectively, elements of the Zionists who penetrated the American government carried out an attack on American buildings and blamed it on innocent Muslims and bombed the head out of the Middle East. That is the most enormous injustice. And the same thing happens with 7-7. And the same injustice is happening on just about every level. Uh, we have people making a fortune out of the banking industry, which is all against God's law because it's all based on usury, the creation of money from money, basically. The same with the um, medical industry, the pharmaceutical industry, giving people drugs that either don't work or are actually extremely bad for them. While at the same time, the one God-given plant that can save our civilization, hemp or cannabis, is banned. These are times of enormous injustice. We have 800 million people on the planet starving, 75 million of which every year will die. Not a single one of those people should die. Everybody should grow hemp. 
and feed themselves. It's perfect nutrition for a human being. As I say, the God-given plant to build your civilization on is the one they ban. That should tell people that we are living under a corrupt, unjust government, unjust government that's not working in the interest of the people, but is working in the interest of a tiny elite group of bankers. Now, fortunately, that is starting to dawn on people because they've seen what's happened in the banking industry in recent years. Um, so we see at the moment the enormous injustice of the end times, the dark essentially before the dawn. Now I'm saying that that dawn is coming, or uh, for me in one sense it's already come. I've been through the process of what would be called the rapture. My anointment by God I think was, was my own personal rapture. And these things obviously happen in cyclical processes and uh, in future people who choose to, to go by the way of God and the way of Christ, live in love and so on, will also go through a rapture basically. Now the idea that all these so-called Christians who will claim that they follow the word of God and so on will all be lifted up together and so on, they'll be some of the very last people to go. <laughs> because those people who've been, who believe that you can go and stone adulterers or believe that homosexuality is wrong have clearly not been reading their Bible properly and have clearly not read the, read the message of Jesus Christ. But I had this recently on a, a phone-in programme, I was talking about the Jesus stuff, and the guy said, look, and he said we weren't going to do a phone-in. But we've had so many angry phone calls, you know, the usual jamming the switchboard kind of thing, we take a few phone calls. And before they even started, I said that, you know, people who are now phoning me up in anger, who are claiming to be Christians, should look at the teachings in the Sermon on the Mount, where Christ particularly warns against the danger of anger and the unclear thinking that comes from that. And yet the first one phone calls, like, I'm a Christian, I'm angry. It's like, didn't you even hear what I just said on the radio? You know, didn't you even just pause for a second to think about that? She's not getting in, basically, not unless she changes. And this is obviously what I want to stress to everybody as well, is that this whole process is a process of redemption. Anybody who genuinely uh, goes through the process of uh, contrition, or repentance, if you want to call it that, uh, can be saved. You can't change what you've done in the past, but you can change your attitude to it. Um, but truly, the people who go up are the people who, who live in love, essentially, not the people who follow religious rules. In the biblical book of Revelations, we discover much to fear concerning the fate of the human race. The book of Revelation says in Revelations 8, 10 to 11, And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of water, and the name of the star is called Wormwood and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. A truly terrifying prediction, and one that carries all the images already hinted at. Only here the problem is a celestial invader, a star called Wormwood. Other sources say that in spite of revelations, Wormwood has no biblical connections and is the so-called Planet X sometimes called Nibiru. The arrival of Planet X has been the subject of much discussion in recent times, and according to some, the public have been kept in the dark, fearing the spread of panic, mayhem, and alarm. Three sources saying the same thing. Is this the first positive indication of the end? If this wandering planet does arrive and comes into close proximity with the Earth, what would happen? What does the seer have to say about this? In Quatrain 69, Century 1, Nostradamus says, The great mountain, one mile in circumference, after peace, war, famine, and flooding, it was spread far, drowning antiquities and then mighty foundations. Are these clues to the nature of the calamity? Does this predict a natural disaster totally unparalleled in human history? Is the population of the entire planet plunged into turmoil and chaos as the effects of the intruder are felt? Yeah, now obviously people have looked at what is going to happen to humanity in the end times. And, and that in some way is an irrelevant question because it's a journey of individual souls. 
it's not a question that all humanity will be saved or none of humanity will be saved or anything like that. You're each on an individual journey with God, you're answerable to God, therefore it's up to you to essentially save your own soul by living in love. Um, now I personally believe that the reason we have six to seven billion souls here at the moment is that they will all go up in, into the new world, basically. Or in fact, as it makes clear in the book of Revelation, in fact, heaven is coming to earth. Um, it's not like a physical ascension upwards when we do get an ascension, it's more like the universe changes shape around us and we find ourselves at higher consciousness within that, basically. Um, but therefore, for humanity, what everybody has to do now is take a long, hard look at themselves. That is the very first part of this process, and one often missed out by political activists who I think are just as bad as the people they're opposing. They're, they're often motivated by anger and revenge and hatred. And if you're motivated by those things, calm will only give you those things back. And this is why left-wing groups seem to splinter into ever more inconsequential and insignificant groupings, basically. Uh, that what we have to do is unite under love. That's what we can unite under, basically. Um, and the message of a human being is to stop listening to the bullshit. Because there's people out there who think they're good people. There's people who are paying their taxes, for example, think that they're looking after other people. But they're not. They're funding war and torture and murder. And until we get that message across to them, again, they will not be ascending to the new world. But everybody um, has, can make a choice. They have free will. And that choice must be to stop funding that system. And they stop funding that system by paying their taxes into it. Now, fortunately, we've got a very legal, uh, 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 sorry, a lawful reason for them not to pay their taxes. They won't even be breaking the law. Obviously, I've got to convince them of that. But that is part of how the world will be changed in the adoption of the law of God, which says, serve God and love your neighbours, you love yourself rather than laws which have come about through constitutions and have been passed by governments, which in fact are the reason we're in this mess at the moment. So every human being can always choose to do the good, the, the good thing in any given circumstance. If every man on earth and every woman on earth said, I'm not going to pick up a gun and fight it at the point of view of somebody else, there'd be no more wars. Simple as that. And let's get this right. The man at the end of the chain who pulls the trigger bears the karma. People want to deflect attention from him. They want to say, oh, he's manipulated, he's under orders or whatever. But nevertheless, he still has free will. It's not the people ordering him who bear the brunt of the karma, or they bear the karma for giving the order. He still bears the brunt of the karma for pulling the trigger, basically. And people have got to understand things like that. So getting into the new world is really very simple. We've had, you know, millennia of people literally hand drawing and quartering each other, torturing each other, the wars, the suffering they have been over this secret trying to find out the secret pronunciation of the name of God, the name of the Messiah, the, the secret potion or stone that will give you the way to eternal life. And actually, the whole thing is absolutely obvious to a five-year-old. It's love. We just make it too complicated. There are no secret techniques. There's no secrets in the Bible. It's all there. It explains it all to you, basically. So all those people who've been in search of a holy grail, looking for a cup or whatever, or even the people who've been in pursuit of the holy grail, thinking it's merely a metaphor for some spiritual um, transformation that will be brought upon them, rather than something they will do themselves, are wrong. <laughs> the, the, the primary meaning of the Holy Grail is the Messiah is the receptacle of the Holy Spirit, basically. And anybody who was looking for an object was never going to find it, basically. So now is the time for every human being to know that he'll be judged by what he's done, and if he's done something wrong, and says, I know I've done that wrong, I'm not going to do it again, wipes the karmic slate clear. So it's not doom and gloom, basically. In fact, interestingly, actually, the word doomsday um, is one of those words whose original meaning has been completely perverted. The word doom was the word for law. So the, the, it's the day of the law, not the day of destruction, basically. And the, say the return of that law is the law of God, that you love God and you love your neighbours, you love yourself. You don't cause harm to another human being. That is just so simple. That is the law in a nutshell. You don't need to know all their books, all their constitutions, everything else. All that goes out the window. St. John of Patmos was not the first one to prophesy the end times and he was certainly not um, the only one to have an idea in the whole world. Take for instance the flood, Noah, right? Chap in the Bible. There's not that much about him in what's left. The Council of Nicaea stripped a load of books and there were plenty more places where the church cut out different books of the Bible. Every civilization pretty much has a flood story not necessarily all at the same time but they do have floods that are either very very big but local or worldwide 
and this is responsible for a huge thing. In the same way, you have other books of the Bible, such as the book of Enoch, you know, the book of Noah. Um, you have um, the different Armageddons, which are generally known as Gnostic, found in the Nag Hammadi Library. These are all uh, very interesting texts which portray slightly different versions of how the end times will come about. Not conflicting with Revelation, but offering a different perspective. As we said, prophecy is not a precise thing, and if you're looking to give um, an account of what you've seen, you can't always give the same account as somebody else, because just as there are different perspectives on everything, there's going to be a different perspective on the end times. Okay? What you find as Revelation progresses is that it focuses quite heavily on the themes around um, the tribulation, the sorrows that before mankind, um, the redemption in Christ, and then what happens afterwards. Um, Satan, Lucifer, not necessarily the same person, in fact generally not, and all the fighting, all the wars, all the plagues, pestilences, the terrible things that are going to make up this. But if you look at the world lately, that's pretty much where we are. It's human nature to, to strive, to conflict, and at the moment it certainly seems to be human nature to find a way to do over the other guy. And that's where we are. We're looking at um, various sweeping events. There's things like um, the microchip for wireless transactions, um, which could for and in a safe be placed in the back of the right hand. Barcodes, which already have the digits 6, 6 and 6 as the strong lines to support the entire process, which was thought up because someone said, hey, I know, let's try that 666 thing out of the Bible. And you've got all sorts of bits in between where things are slowly creeping towards. The economic crash, I don't see how that could possibly not lead eventually to a single world payment. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. According to some fundamentalist believers in biblical prophecy, this act of destruction heralds the beginning of the end when only they will be saved. Some of these groups believe that the number will be a mere 144,000 and the rest of the population will be doomed. In their version of the future, as represented in the Bible, first, Israel finally becomes a fully-fledged nation recognized in the Middle East. This part of the prophecy they already believe has been fulfilled. Soon after this, the world will fall under the dominion of a single unified government, a single common currency, and a single religion. The believers also fear that the single monetary system will allow for constant satanic surveillance via automatic cash points, credit cards, and even barcodes, each of which already supposedly contain the digits 666, the number of the beast. When this finally occurs, all true believers will be raptured into heaven and the battle against Satan and his hordes will be left to those who did not believe. Yeah, people have no doubt read in the book of Revelation that the 144,000, who are also known sometimes as the Congregation of Saints or the Elective God or the Order of Melchizedek, the Order of the Righteous King, uh, and many people, and this is reflecting things like the Jehovah's Witnesses and Gideons, believe that only 144,000 souls will be saved and therefore there's competition to get into heaven. Again, this is a kind of misinterpretation of, of, of the nature of man. and. The great revelation to me during my awakening was that, that Jesus, the one true God, lives as a soul and incarnates as a human being, and has done across history. That the idea that God came to earth once is only in fact an idea held by modern Western culture. The Greco-Roman myths, the gods incarnate as men, as they continue to do in all of the Eastern myths. So to be clear what the 144,000 are, I'll give you an example of this, is Mark Antony is the incarnation of Jesus of his day, the very famous Roman. Now obviously he dies, um, 
but from the, the Jesus soul incarnates the next man, who was a man called Astrologies, or Astrologies, he's the one who's nailed to a cross, yeah? But Mark Antony and Astrologies will reincarnate for the end times to help the Messiah. And those are the 144,000, basically. And what it means, of course, is because they're more closely connected to the soul of God, the Jesus soul, they again will see it more clearly. Uh, but with all these things I stress is that you know, God deals you a hand of cards, he gives you your, your genetic makeup. But it's still up to you what you do with that, basically. There's too much emphasis in our society, people being controlled by their genes. They're not. That's a hand you've got to play. And, you know, for example, in my case, I have absolutely no musical ability whatsoever. No matter how much I struggle with that, God hasn't given me that particular card to play, so don't bother. But God has given me many talents, like sitting here in front of a camera, you get a Jesus for your age, a man who can work the modern media and so on. Um, and that is my talent I can develop. But that's what it's all about. And even with things like, you know, perhaps susceptibility to disease in genes is not something we have to necessarily go down with. We can change that from our behaviours and so on. Um, so the 144,000 are of a, perhaps a, a different order from what we'd think of as the average soul. But again, they've all still got to get there through their own actions. It's a bit like me, I'm born to be the Christ. But I've still got to make the right act, got to make the right decisions at the right time to get there, basically. And you know, thanks to God, we all got there in the end. And, and that is the one thing that really has to happen for the end times to begin, is the Messiah has to wake up. He doesn't wake up, it's all over. That's happened, so as far as I'm concerned, it's inevitable. I've started to see all these things happening, the changes. Um, going to festivals over the years, I've seen the change from what I call New Age bull to genuine um, spiritual inquiry, basically. And so, well, as far as I'm concerned, we are smack bang in the middle of the end times and um, the 144,000 will be waking up shortly, basically. We like to think that we've got loads of time. We might do, but there's a strong possibility we haven't because we could already be on the Doomsday timetable. If we're finding ourselves in the middle of the plagues and wars, the famines, if we're finding that we've not got that, that comfortable buffer that, oh, well, it's not started yet, it's still all mad. If you're not going to be literalist about it, then you can be quite generic and say that, well, okay, these are just trends that are going to affect us, um, or it's something that's you know, already happened, but it's happening again. But if you reckon that it's definitely going to happen in the future, that you're going to get the temple rebuilt, that you're going to have the Antichrist, the Beast, and all of their friends, then you have to admit that what we're seeing now is pretty interesting. The first three and a half years, time of prosperity, it's, things are good. Um, people are coming together. There's a sense that, that things can be made whole, made one. And that's it's not a slippery slope because a good thing is a good thing. But we have to be careful where it goes to. In the middle of the seven year period, 1260 days in you have a small period where things change you have um, some prophets that turn up you have um, an assassination of the lovely chap that we've all been following around who is great the Antichrist and his miraculous survival of what should have been a mortal wound you then have um, this brilliant descent into almost sort of um, classical debauchery in the temple has been recreated um, where this guy will demand, or girl, will demand worship um, and sacrifice and that no one shall do anything apart from in their name. That's never a good plan at the best of times and it's got to be said that I'm not looking forward to that part because if I'm supposed to be one of the guys in the know, I'm going to say no. If I say no, that'll end badly for me. So we're going to get to a stage where people are forced into doing things that go against ethics, morals, personal beliefs. The last three and a half years are not going to be fun. Now you can hope that the rapture happens at the start, but there's also a strong body of thought for the middle and especially for the end of the seven year period for being the rapture. The idea that the dead will rise first before the living are given their immortal bodies. But the dead don't rise until Christ turns up, and Christ doesn't turn up until the end. That presents a couple of problems. There are other things. Coming back to the um, Mount of Olives splitting, that's when the chosen people will flee through the gap in the Mount of Olives. And if the chosen people are gone, how can they flee? 
So there has to be a bit of space around the idea that, like, oh, there's a tribulation, but don't worry, we'll be raptured. I, I know there's a fantastic service where you can pay someone to look after your dog if you've been raptured. I think that's great. That's the best money-making idea ever. But I'm not sure it's going to be needed at all. One single quotation has given rise to belief in the rapture. Thessalonians 4, 16-17 says, And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Those deemed unworthy of salvation will witness a spectacle of the chosen few floating up to the heavens. The idea that the faithful will be raised into the heavens finds a close parallel in the physical resurrection of Christ following his death on the cross. Scripture says that on the third day he was taken into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. Might those who choose to interpret Scripture in this manner be trying to emulate the man they claim to worship? Following the rapture comes the tribulation, when Israel will be attacked by Russia along with its allies, chief among these will be Iran. Although thousands still perish, the attack fails miserably because God strikes down the invaders with earthquakes and rains of fire. This scenario has been interpreted as meaning Israel will launch its nuclear arsenal at the invaders, a prospect that would have grim repercussions the world over. At the very end times, there is the tribulation. Um, and this basically is when the universe changes shape. Now to be clear, at the moment, we live on what's called a tree of life. Uh, anybody who doesn't know what that looks like, look it up in, in Kabbalah. And the, the central simplicity of this is it's 10 consciousnesses attached to the tree, and the one consciousness of knowledge not attached. That is the current, if you like, the arrangement of God, if you like, the arrangement of the universe, depending on your vocabulary. And that, around the end of December 2012, although obviously the motion has already begun to, to, to start that change in shape, but will fully form at the end of December 2012, when we go into a universe which is 12 consciousnesses around the one, but that's in three dimensions like that to depict it, basically. And obviously this is where we get Jacob and the 12 tribes of Israel from, Christ and 12 disciples. It's not about a story, it's about saying this is the new construction of the universe. So the Bible, once you start to interpret it different ways, you realize it makes a hell of a lot of sense, tells you a hell of a lot of truth, but just not in the way you, you think it does. Um, and that actual tribulation, there will be a point where we, we go back to a unity again. But at the moment, we have um, our sun and our solar system is in fact circling a black sun. Now again, when I was first told this by God, I didn't know anything about this, but I went and talked to some scientists, and there is a fringe belief in mainstream science that there are, in fact, there is a black sun to parallel our sun, basically. And that if you then start to develop that, the black sun appears to be the black hole that will help with the change in the construction of the universe in 2012, that all the bad stuff will be sucked into the black hole, and we, the chosen ones or whatever, will go to, uh, a, through what's called a white hole of consciousness. We'll all briefly return to the unity, We'll come out the other side, the universe constructed, and we will have changed enormously. Um, to give you an idea of how great this change is, it is the greatest change since a God without form took form, i.e. the Big Bang or the Flash of Creation or whatever you want to call it, the creation of the Holy Spirit. Um, so, and it's also, again, according to the Bible, we are coming to the end of the sixth day and we go into the seventh. You know, people have misinterpreted the Bible, they read at the beginning of Genesis, God created the world in, in, seven, in six days, then on the seventh rested. That's not the history of the Bible, the world to start with, that's like the executive summary. All the rest of it you're hearing about will take place within that time period. And indeed, that's why in, in the Bible it talks about the necessity of Jesus Christ being absolutely integral to the changing of the universe, basically. And therefore, 
The six days of creation are over. We're now in the age of the Messiah when God rests, essentially. So we're going into a situation in which we'll be able to metabolize light so we don't have the same mad dash for energy to survive. That's obviously created problems in this world. We essentially will be immortals, basically. Um, we'll also, I think, be able to travel in what we call now time, <laughs> almost like Doctor Who. <laughs> uh, and those people, of course, who choose not to go to the way of love because they have a perfect right to do that with free will, I'm saying I don't think anybody will, but I think you know, they have a perfect right to do that, will in fact, say, be sucked into the, the black hole and will become part of a Borg-like collective that we see on Star Trek with very little personal autonomy and answerable to a central consciousness. And this is essentially what is changing in 2012, is the move from group consciousness back to individual consciousness. To survive in this world as an individual human being is virtually impossible. If you had to go and get all your water, your food, your shelter, everything else, it would be impossible. So we have, have to work in groups for the people. But of course, when we come to work with those groups, it's kind of a question of how far we will compromise our values to survive. Um, and the most dangerous thing, believe me, on the planet is groupthink. Most people know that the, the Satan or the uh, ego or selfishness is wrong. But what they don't realise is group consciousness is even more wrong. <laughs> and yet they don't. They think that they're giving up their ego for the group is a good thing. No, you give up your ego for God, for love, not for the opinions of other human beings, basically. So the most significant part of the transition is we'll be able to survive by ourselves. Essentially, we become gods, as is predicted in the Bible, as predicted by Hermes Trismegistus. Know this, ye are gods. And that's part of the frustration of my message, is trying to tell these human beings that you are gods, if only you look inside yourselves and find it. You know, we talk about all sorts of evil on the planet, but no man is evil per se. A man is capable of evil acts, but he is not evil per se. Even the Antichrist, even the current incarnation of Satan that I've identified, is a man with a soul, basically. He is not the incarnation of pure evil. That kind of sort of comic book, dark and light, is what causes all the problems on the planet, basically. Um, so we've got to believe, and I say everybody who truly believes in God knows that it's their duty to try and save every human being. It doesn't matter how evil they are, it doesn't matter whether they've murdered millions or whatever, or they've abused lots of children, it's your job uh, to forgive them and show them the way of love. Peace has now been established and there is harmony in the land. Then, a powerful and charismatic leader emerges from Europe to negotiate a new peace process throughout the Middle East. And it will endure for seven years. For the first time, the Antichrist is recognizable for who he really is and the tribulation begins. The world is dominated by one government and in place of Christianity, the Antichrist convinces the remaining doubters to fall down and worship him. Who is this Antichrist? Is it someone already familiar to us? Or will it be some anonymous figure? It had been suggested that the Antichrist is the former British Prime Minister, Tony Blair. Since leaving office, he has led diplomatic efforts to stabilize the Middle East through negotiation and compromise. It has also been said that his candidacy was confirmed by the late Pope John Paul II, who was also identified as the Antichrist. And upon his death, the mantle fell to his acolyte, Blair. The control of the Antichrist is absolute for this seven year period, and he puts the mark of the beast on the remaining population. The satanic mark takes the form of an occult symbol placed on all forms of currency, perhaps on barcodes, too. To make certain of his domination of the human race, an electronic ID chip is implanted under the skin of every single human being. The rules imposed by the Antichrist make it impossible for anyone to survive in this world without using currency bearing his mark. Civilization continues to sleepwalk to its ruin, but two Jews who refuse to believe his propaganda penetrate the security ring surrounding the Antichrist and successfully assassinate him. But this is not yet the end, and after three days, with Satan's help, he rises from the dead. 
the population are struck dumb and worship him as their savior, and those still refusing to believe in him are cruelly murdered. The Antichrist and his henchmen, the false prophet, are human but draw their inspiration, strength, and sustenance from Satan. For them, he is not only the true God, but the dreaded God of the abyss. Each era has produced a version of the Antichrist, all with the necessary attributes, but so far the end times have not occurred. However, right now dark omens are gathering. There are wars and rumors of wars. There is disease and pestilence. There is suffering and starvation. Are the four horsemen of the apocalypse already stalking the planet? So we have war, we have famine, we have disease, we have all these horrible things. Um, you know what we really need? We need someone to help out. We need a guy who's strong, who's courageous, who has Christ-like appeal, who will be able to move hearts and minds of nations. And we need him to take it all and make it all go away and sort it all out. Now, a lot of people thought Mr. Obama might be this person. The problems he's had getting socialised healthcare for people, I don't think that's him because it would have happened by now. Click, everyone has healthcare. The Antichrist is not a bad guy. You don't go around going, watch out, that man's evil, that could be the Antichrist. It's not. It's only when the change happens, when Satan, Lucifer, the bad guy, the real bad guy of the Bible, actively takes over control of this person that it becomes what we know is the Antichrist. So you can't help but like the guy. That's, that's the whole point. Whoever the Antichrist is or was or is going to be, he's going to do real good things for the world and almost he's in a very uh, unfortunate position where if the Antichrist ever regains control of his faculties after the period of possession, um, absorption, whatever you want to call it, he's going to see what he's done. And it's going to be terrible. Because all these people who pin their hopes and dreams for a world of prosperity on him, he's failed them. But ultimately, part of the grand scheme, so we hope, it works out okay in the end. Now the figure of the Antichrist has obviously caused enormous concern to humanity. Um, the story's most recently been told in the, in the Omen series of films. Um, obviously, because of the nature of the universe and the nature of polarity, if there is a Christ, there will be an Antichrist. But the figure of the Antichrist, I've got to stress, it's not a figure who is born to be the Antichrist. The Antichrist is actually like a floating title, because by definition, he who most opposes the Christ will be the Antichrist. Now, when I was reading the book of Revelation many years ago, and I was still an atheist, and believe me, I read it many times trying to make sense of it, and didn't make sense of it until my awakening. One of the things that struck me is you couldn't really distinguish who was the Antichrist and who was the Christ. There's a line where it talks about this man will rule with a rod of iron, and obviously the Zionists have taken that to be their evil Antichrist, ruling with authority and suppressing humanity. But in fact, to, to rule with, in fact, the rod of Aaron, which is where you find my name as well, and uh, mentioned in the Bible, it's also in the Ark of the Covenant, would make more sense of that line than the rod of iron. And again, to rule with authority is simply to rule without having to confer with the council. It doesn't have to be evil authoritarian rule. I mean, we've had many kings who ruled uh, with authoritarianism and have ruled justly and, and done very good things for the country. You know, you say group consciousness is in some way the, the worst way for them. The king has to consult a council. Uh, his best endeavours can be stopped. So the thing the Antichrist has caused enormous concern, and I have to say this, is that until I awoke as the Christ, I was the Antichrist. I was the greatest impediment to Jesus Christ's awakening, therefore I was the Antichrist. Once I had actually gone on the mission of love, although before I actually become the Christ, it was quite clear to me that the man opposing me, and indeed, I blew the whistle in 1997, three months into Tony Blair's premiership. All the way through that premiership, I did battle with him in various ways. And then come 2005, after a spiritual awakening, I spent a lot of time meditating, lots of love to him. But I don't think it's any coincidence that the day I was anointed by God, the day I was made Christ, was Tony Blair's very last day in office, basically. Now, Tony Blair is an incarnation of the Archangel Michael. There are seven incarnations of the Archangel Michael at the moment. He's one of them, and of course, the Archangel Michael is the opponent of Yeshua, or Jesus. And that's what the word Satan actually means in Kabbalah, is the opponent. In Kabbalah, it either means the ego, 
or your opponent, your adversary. So on that basic level, Michael is Satan in that he opposes the Christ. And you see with Blair, he hasn't got it. He doesn't understand spirituality. He claims to be a man of God, but is in fact a man of religion. He sets up faith foundations. He believes that by joining the Catholic Church, he can somehow gain redemption. But these are all to do with rules and regulations and the intervention of man. Only God can truly forgive you, and Blair hasn't seen that. So, and what I'm, to what I'm told by God, what I know from my own experience, is that Blair is an extremely vain man, possibly even bisexual, which is quite common in incarnations of Michael, and that he is, that for a period, he was the Antichrist. And even now, while he continues to play a role in the Middle East and tries to influence mainstream politics, he is still, in a sense, playing that role. But I stress that, you know, that doesn't mean to say he's pure evil. He's got a lot of blood in his hands, don't forget, the deaths of two million in the Middle East, the unjust wars, the failure to get to grips with things like 9-11 and 7-7, and of course, my persecution at his hands as well. Uh, but I, you know, I don't reject Blair, I, my, my message has always been to him, is, is, you know, come to me, I can show you a better way. But that to me is, is the Antichrist. Now obviously there's different figures as well because the incarnation of Satan is different from the incarnation of the devil, basically. Because say Satan represents the opponent of Christ, uh, the devil represents group consciousness, that's why the devil has no soul. Um, and again, I stress that there is an incarnation of the devil, <laughs> although he's not the incarnation of pure evil, he's not someone famous. Um, so these people are there, they do incarnate uh, as beings here, and that is a logical corollary of um, as above, so below. I mean, I say to people who think it's, you know, fairy tale stuff that the gods incarnate as human beings, so certainly when I first went through my spiritual awakening, I thought that was the case. I thought there were consciousnesses up there, like the consciousness of Michael, the consciousness of Gabriel, the consciousness of Jesus, and these kind of compete for our attention. But to me, it's the logic of God's universe. God's going to go and want to see his own creation. If you have, um, if you want to create a unity, really you've got to have a one to create a unity around. If you're going to try and create Christ consciousness in this world, it can't just be created out of nothing. It has to be created from the experiences of a man who becomes the Christ. And this is why it's really important that Jesus Christ lives as a man without knowing he's a God, because then he knows how to overcome the, 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 the kind of day in, day out challenges you face as a normal human being. The Dalai Lama is an incarnation of the God of compassion. But he doesn't understand what it's like to be a normal human being. He's been fated from the age of three of being a living God. He has no idea what it's like to be a normal human being. So if you're going to teach people something, you've got to know how to overcome those uh, setbacks. And that's what I've learned from my process. But the same, the idea that there is no evil out there, or the idea, the, the opposite of that, that people are born evil is entirely wrong. Anybody who's truly following this mission will know that it doesn't matter whether they're Antichrist, it doesn't matter how many people have killed and tortured, they can still be saved. Armies once again face one another in Israel, one side led by the reborn Antichrist ready for another war to take absolute control and he arrays his forces against the combined might of Russia and China. But supernatural agencies warn him that Christ and his angels are about to attack and he convinces the Russian and Chinese governments to join forces with him against a common foe. The dogs of war are unleashed and long-awaited apocalypse finally begins between the forces of God and the Antichrist on the plains of Megiddo. The battle is fierce and bloody, and the Antichrist and his lieutenant are captured and condemned to permanent torment, forever shackled together in a lake of fire. A new and glorious thousand-year kingdom is established on earth, and the law of God reigns supreme. All the faithful who were raptured before the tribulation began are returned to this new earthly paradise. Satan is again confined to hell, but only for 1,000 years. The new version of Christ who leads the armies of God is a vengeful Christ and has no time for unbelievers and like his father, Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, he kills all who fail to recognize and worship him. But even this is not yet the end. 
And after the thousand years of glory has ended, Satan emerges yet again from hell to challenge God's authority and another, but this time, final, almighty conflict erupts. The earth is utterly pulverized and a new earth descends from the heavens. This time, Satan, finally locked away until the end of time itself, and there is everlasting heaven on earth. Biblical truth, prophetic insight, or sheer fantasy, these are the claims made for both biblical prophecy and the predictions of Nostradamus. But are there any other interpretations that might be taken from these warnings of the impending apocalypse? There's been a battle, essentially, for the souls of mankind going on for 6,000 years now, since the inception of, of Babylon, and that's the beginning of the, the calendar of light. And we've essentially lived under the monetary system, what the Bible calls mammal. And these 6,000 years are the Dark Ages, not the period from about 400 AD to 1000 AD in, this, in, in Europe. That wasn't, in fact, the Dark Age at all. What we've lived through are, are the Dark Ages. And through that process, the dark side through its agency, its secret societies, and its governments, and everything else, has performed one long experiment trying to find the best way of controlling humanity. Now, considering they've got all the wealth and everything else, they haven't done a very good job of this. You know, they still more than 50% of the people on the planet believe in God. There's six billion Bibles out there, and they actually destroy every one of them, so they destroyed the law. So they've not really done their job very well at all. And it actually shows that even in a realm of 1% light and 99% darkness, which is what we, what we live in that essentially God and love will, will triumph, even despite all the stuff going on around us. Now those control mechanisms are laid out in a document called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Now, many people will say it's an anti-Semitic forgery. Uh, those people who claim that will first have to look up the meaning of the word Semite, which they've got completely wrong, and we have to look up the word forgery, because for a forgery to be something, it has to be based on something. And this is not a forgery of some other documents. It's not like a, a bunch of nice, Zionist international bankers got together and said we're going to save humanity by providing them with all these resources and so on. Not the case at all. There was an international Zionist congress which essentially resolved to control humanity and those and that meeting was penetrated and somebody wrote up an account of the meeting accurately um, and indeed anybody who has their eyes vaguely open will notice that during the 20th century they used all of these techniques to control the human population uh, including to do with money supplies to create recessions and depressions using uh, pharmaceuticals like vaccinations, using ideas like Darwinism and Marxism. Uh, these are all control mechanisms and all, we're all part of that eternal battle of good and evil, the fight for uh, the human heart. Um, and what you actually realise comes out of history is that anybody who really hits these people's power, the bankers' power, i.e. tries to take control of the money supply, is instantly killed. This is what happens to JFK. Abraham Lincoln, Julius Caesar, it's behind the American War of Independence, the Glorious Revolution in Britain. In fact, virtually every historical event has some uh, link to the control of the money supply. But that, of course, is a wider story because the most famous story in the Bible is that Jesus Christ goes into the temple and turns the table on the money changers, because the usurers, anybody making money out of money, not just charging interest. And that's why they've gone for it. The dark side has always seen a figure like that as a potential Christ figure, including Kennedy and they've shot them. And obviously that, the proof is in the pudding. If you die, you're not the Christ, <laughs> because the Christ is born to be immortal. So that battle for the soul of humanity has been going on in all sorts of peculiar ways. Um, the, the reason I think that so many people in the elite were against communism is because it was an attempt to create a godless humanity. That all other constitutions recognize God, basically, and that's where the law comes from, the truth and justice. So that's what they, they say took against communism. And um, indeed, there's been enormous propaganda in my lifetime, some of which I believed, against God, to confuse religion with God. I was the kind of stupid person who would say, well, the Bible says God stoned adulterers, therefore it's all wrong. But the Bible has never stoned adulterer, God's never stoned adulterer, that's been done with the free will of a human being. So it's understanding stuff like that, very simple stuff on the journey. So this battle for humanity, the dark side tried very hard, it's had all the aces up its sleeve, but ultimately, they didn't do what they had to do, and that was stop the Christ awakening. The Christ awoke, and therefore the battle for humanity is over, and that's why I'm saying that in the run-up to the end times, it should be run-up to the end. Mankind. Interesting place. Lots of movies about why God, the devil, or Bob wants their soul. 
right? Why you should turn one way, why you should turn another way. In the enlightened times, the idea that there's no such thing as demons or there's no such thing as spirits, um, they sort of get sort of like accepted. And people go to church and people say the words and people stand up and people sit down. But really, Jesus himself cast demons out of people. He raised the dead. If you want to say that you actively believe in Christ, you have to accept the possibility that there are bad things out in the world, that there are fallen angels, that there are demons, there are things that are in the Bible that are not nice and fluffy. God is love, yes, but God is not everywhere all the time. Well, he is, but he can't make you choose. It's your choice, and there has to be an opposite side. Satan, Sataniel, quite a high-ranking angel who fell at the same time as Lumiel, or Lucifer, as everyone knows him. He has uh, what's called the idea of positive evil. Let's say for a second that you are a 100 meter sprinter and you have to cross that finish line. And no matter how strong your legs are, unless you have the road underneath you, unless you have something to push against, you cannot be fast. All you'll do is you'll free wheel, because you'll be floating, right? Satan does that. The adversary does that. He provides something for good to push against, to show that it's good. Mankind can't function just in a sort of plateau of being ambivalent. You either have to make a choice to do good things, to be holy, righteous, whatever you want to call it, in your own way, for whatever religion, or you choose to take the easy road. Desire, temptation, so on and so forth. I'm not saying that um, people who have feelings, people who follow their feelings, are bad. What I'm saying is that <coughs> it's the struggle internally against um, sort of your own personal demons, or in very real cases for some of us, actual things, that's what makes us good. The battle for mankind has to be won. Not just up there, not just people praying, but people actively choosing. It's not about the going to church, it's about the reason why you're at church and what you want. These horrific images are those foretold by our ancestors and they have endured for millennia. But are there other interpretations? Perhaps there are other explanations for the falling star that seem to square with the prophecies. One alternative involves the huge particle accelerator called the Large Hadron Collider buried deep underground near Geneva in Switzerland. It has been argued that this 20 mile long machine is already a star constructed right here on Earth. Might this be the falling star of prophecy? The cause for concern arises when the subatomic particles within the device begin to travel around the collider at speeds close to that of light. The immense energies produced by the particles may be too great for the magnetic fields designed to contain them and they might fail, allowing these particles to fall right out of containment. Should this ever occur, it is feared that these particles will become microscopic black holes and fall into the center of the planet itself and start to devour it from the inside out until our world finally collapses. Those in charge of the project insist that this cannot happen. But are they correct? And will our precious Earth be destroyed in the quest for knowledge? Similar charges were made decades ago, before the detonation of the first atomic bomb at White Sands in Nevada. Some scientists feared that when the bomb exploded, it would cause a reaction that would ignite the atmosphere and turn the planet into a lifeless fireball. Fortunately, it did not, but the energies involved were much less, and the Large Hadron Collider is designed for a different purpose. One that religion claims is in conflict with God's teachings and which undermines his authority. 
There are even those who claim that the event describing the fall of Wormwood occurred years ago at Chernobyl in Russia, when the core of a nuclear reactor overheated and the contents burned their way out of containment, poisoning the area for centuries to come. It has already cost the lives of hundreds of civilians and soldiers as they tried to seal off the reactor with concrete and the effects of the meltdown were felt the world over as reflected in the Wormwood prophecies. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters and the name of the star is called Wormwood and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. The people were contaminated and their water and land were poisoned by atomic radiation, and even now, they still are. Is this the fulfillment of the prophecy? It is also said that using ancient prophetic techniques of numerology and gemeteria, in the Greek alphabet, the name Chernobyl equates exactly to Wormwood. Is this a clue or sheer coincidence? Will these dire events come to pass in 2012 as prophesied? Will the world begin its headlong descent into madness and chaos, or will we continue on our way to slow extinction through the natural processes? Were the Bible and Nostradamus correct, or is the truth still hidden away? Only time will tell. Do we believe that there's going to be trumpet flares and then suddenly there'll be stars and there'll be things going appearing out of nowhere? Not necessarily. I mean, yeah, okay, at some point it's saying that you know, you'll have demons and gribbly things raining down upon the earth and hopefully there'll be people there with all sorts of interesting weaponry that will sort that out. But until then, you've got to look at what real world events could happen, perceivably. We talked about chip implants. Going back, archaeologically, um, a few of these cycles that we're talking about, you know, 7,000, 14,000 years, that sort of thing, um, there was a huge change in the way um, life worked. Possibly this was the flood. There's the idea, theoretically, that um, the Earth was a lot more humid before the period in the Bible known as the flood. And when the heavens just went thunk, um, all the water fell down upon the Earth. You had a sudden increase in things like solar radiation, cosmic radiation. Um, in a more humid atmosphere, things were bigger. Look at spiders in the rainforest compared to spiders in your back garden. So, yeah, the giants. Um, you got the possibility that uh, human life was short, and we know that sunlight ultimately is a bad thing for the body. And if you've got so much more from all the liquid being out of the air, luckily we're in Britain, we've got plenty of liquid in the air, you um, are at risk of developing cancers. What if the ages in the Bible were right? You know, if Adam lived to 850, if Methuselah lived to 900, whatever. What if that actually happened properly, and that after the flood, when there wasn't the barrier in the atmosphere, that's what brought human lifespan right down? And it's only through you know, clean living, so on and so forth, that we get back up there, and then cancer comes for us anyway. You've got other things. Um, the idea that you could have the Earth's um, magnetic core flip. Whee! That would do all sorts of interesting things. I believe there was a very popular cinematographer piece on that recently. Not sure how much I like that. But the important thing is that there are all sorts of interesting things the planet could do. Global warming debate. Not taking a side. You've got all sorts of um, things, say the um, polar poles they take. Um, where you go through the ice and you see what the carbon levels were, other levels, and the Earth changes. It does things, it does funny things that you don't like. And humanity is not the most important part of the world's operating system. The world has its own agenda, the world will do what it wants, and we're just hanging on as best we can. If something big changes, could it be God, could it be Christ, could it be the Second Coming, could it be the Antichrist, could it be Satan? Maybe. But if it happens, we'll damn well know about it. And I think we're gonna find out pretty soon. Yeah, I mean, I've obviously looked long and hard at the uh, Hadron Collider at CERN in Switzerland. Now, what they're trying to do here is try to essentially bash two protons together 
at the speed of light so that they create antimatter. Now, obviously, God's creation is a physical creation. It's my firm belief that this will have some effect upon the universe. It may even be the, the beginning of the chain reaction that actually changes the universe itself, I don't know. Um, as far as I understand, they haven't actually done it yet, and nothing happens without the say-so of God. So, um, that's probably why that hasn't happened just as yet. But the very fact that that is within our technology. And we have to always remember, of course, that we have an influence on the universe. It's not one way, it's not just God to us, it's us we have an influence on the universe. And therefore we do have the technology, and essentially, to, to bring about this change at the right time. Um, what I find quite interesting in the book of Revelation, though, is, is the phrase on the word wormwood. Uh, now this is one of the little codes that comes up in the Bible from time to time. Obviously people have written screens over the years about it. Now again, I've cracked the code. Uh, I'm not actually at liberty to tell you what it, what it actually says. Although God says it's up to humanity to crack a few of these codes. But I can give you a clue. And the clue is, the solution is on the Shagba monument in the 22 letter name of God. <laughs> that will give you the rules for breaking it basically. Um, but it, you know, like with all these things, it's not bad. <laughs> Although it's set in a context of something bad about bitter waters and all this sort of thing. Actually, what it talks about is a star falling from heaven, which is a metaphor for the Messiah, basically. And there's a tendency, obviously, amongst human beings to go along the kind of woe and doom uh, channel rather than looking at the good side of things. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, all this end time stuff, I'm absolutely convinced that all of this is happening. Um, in all sorts of peculiar ways, and say it's the way the banking system is, for example, being exposed. The way we're seeing more and more exposure of the pharmaceuticals industry, which is giving people chemicals that are deliberately designed to stop a spiritual awakening. If you've been in charge for 6,000 years, you and your uh, descendants, and you've had a slave class, which is essentially what humanity has been to those people, you get very resentful from that slave class, somebody turns around and says, no, we're enough of this. <laughs> So they are actively trying to stop this human spiritual awakening, doing everything they can with it. And you know, I point out that the symptoms of the spiritual awakening are the same as what they call the symptoms of schizophrenia, basically. What happens is when somebody has that process, they need to go to somebody who's spiritual who can take them through that process. Because obviously it's a turbulent and difficult process to go through, and you will think you're going mad. However, um, if you give those people chemicals based on fluoride, which is what things like uh, Prozac and Siroxat are, you're essentially bringing down their spiritual vibrations. So you've got somebody who's been drawn up by God, been brought down by chemicals, of course it's going to wrench them apart, they're going to be in the mental health system for the rest of their lives. But really, if you look at evil on the planet, evil comes from psychiatrists as far as I'm concerned. Psychiatrists have never, never cured anybody, they poison lots of people, they are an enemy of your spiritual awakening. Anybody who thinks you can understand human beings through brain chemistry, again, clearly isn't being watching um, so yeah, so we're right in the end times, we've got two years to go, and so our message to everybody is really, really quite simple. It's, you know, ensure that you are really free. There's nothing more dangerous than a slave who falsely believes he's free. And realise that it's within your power. If you can conquer your own fear, you can then live in love. And if you live in love, what the hell do you have to be worried about? And it's only because people get worried and get scared and frightened that we have wars, and people start stealing off each other and so on. So, I say to every human being out there, when they say to me, what can I do about this? You can do the most simple thing, and that's live in love. Where nothing's what it seems